Hello and welcome to Parmenology Read Aloud. I'm Dr. Anshu Maneja Arora and today I'm back with another video. This time I decided to record it with my video because I wanted to specially thank you all for appreciating my channel and my videos. Uh, it's been great meeting you all at the conferences recently and hearing the feedback. So um, let's get going. Let's learn more and more. So today I've chosen uh, GINA guidelines again and some of you may remember that I already have a video on GINA guidelines 2023 uh, which was about the recent changes in GINA guidelines and that video was more of a consolidated video of the only the changes in the guidelines. So I did not deal with any in-depth information about the guidelines. So that's a quick reference in case you want to quickly revise the changes in the guidelines. I'm going to again uh, put the link in my description and on the card above but uh, so now I've decided to break down the GINA guidelines uh, into various parts so the easiest way to do that will be taking the chapters that GINA has presented in its report so this will be short short videos of multiple relevant parts of the guidelines so that we do not miss out on any important information so let's not waste time and let's get started So, uh, number one is the definition of uh, asthma. You all agree that asthma is a heterogeneous disease and uh, this is very important to remember when we are talking about definition of asthma because now we have phenotypes of asthma, treatable traits of asthma and we understand that asthma behaves differently in different individuals. So, it is a heterogeneous disease. We all know it is characterized by chronic airway inflammation. We have seen its symptoms, so we can count on the symptoms as cough, wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness. Also, what's very important in asthma diagnosis is that it is a variable disease. Variability is the essence of asthma. So, asthma is variable with time and intensity. So, if you perform diagnostic testing for asthma on one instance, you may get some uh, diagnosis, but in the other instance, you may actually feel that this turned out to be normal, like a spirometry which may be normal at some times also. So it is variable with time and also in its intensity and there is variable expiratory airflow limitation. But over a period of time, we all agree that asthma can start behaving like COPD if it's chronic and then there may be chronic airflow limitation, a persistent airflow limitation in asthmatics as well. Now, GINA guidelines have beautifully divided asthmatics into five main phenotypes. This is very important. It's the upcoming future of asthma. And um, uh, asthma phenotypes have further evolved to another concept called treatable traits. I did present a talk on it recently. And um, if you all want, then I can also uh, talk about that topic in one of the videos and share uh, that presentation with you. So, but phenotypic assessment is very essential in asthma and in future we have to do phenotypic assessment of most patients. What phenotype is? It's actually any characteristic which could be a single or multiples or clusters of characteristics and which, which show the person as it is. So, the behavior, the clinical characteristic, the way any person presents, a disease presents, so, same disease in different individual can present in different forms. So, that characteristic is called a phenotype. And in severe asthma, the role of phenotype and treatment response is very well established. But uh, as I said, treatable trait is a concept which is telling us that even phenotypes are not mutually exclusive. You can work on different traits uh, amongst phenotypes. So, that's for later. But for now, the GINA guidelines have divided asthmatics into five main phenotypes based on a lot of cluster analysis and research. And they found out that asthma could be allergic asthma, asthma could be non-allergic asthma, adult onset asthma, asthma with persistent airflow limitation, and asthma with obesity has been identified as a separate entity. So, allergic asthmatics are usually, they start having asthma since childhood, so they have very strong history of atopy or eczema or food allergy or any kind of allergy including allergic rhinitis and because it's allergic it has eosinophilic inflammation and because it has eosinophilic inflammation 
This group is very well responsive to corticosteroids. The other subtype is non-allergic asthma. These usually are late onset asthmatics. They are also obese and they, in a lot of cases, and sorry for the spell, but they are uh, usually smokers. So smoker asthmatics usually have the non-allergic type or phenotype. They may not have eosinophilic inflammation, so they'll have neutrophilic or posigranocytic inflammation and they are less responsive to inhaled corticosteroids. The third subtype is adult onset asthmatics, usually again late onset. A lot of studies have noted that this subtype is more common in women. They are also usually non-atopic to begin with. They are characterized by posigranocytic inflammation. So again, you may not see a very beautiful response of inhaled corticosteroids. They may be more refractory and need higher doses. The fourth subtype is asthma with persistent airflow limitation. So this is the one where we say airway remodeling has occurred. They are very severe. The symptoms are not getting controlled. They are long-standing asthmatics with either persistent airflow limitation or only partially reversible. So they start behaving more like COPDs. And asthma with obesity has been defined separately. It has very strong implications in treatment because their respiratory symptoms are uh, not only because of this obesity, but also because of asthma. And here also we see less of eosinophilic inflammation. The diagnostic flow chart of uh, asthma has been revised to some extent. What it says is we first obviously look for the respiratory symptoms. Now, if your patient matches the respiratory symptoms, you've taken a detailed history, you have to show that your patient has a variable airflow limitation. So that's very important. And that's how you arrive at the diagnosis of asthma. So spirometry becomes very, very important in asthma diagnosis in today's date. Now you've taken a detailed history and examination and that supports asthma. You've done the spirometry. If your patient you think is already on ICS controlling treatment, you just modify his treatment level. And um, if he needs a step up or step down, you do according to the flow chart that is defined for it. Now, if your patient has not undergone spirometric testing or uh, you've not yet proven that there's a variable airflow limitation, you would want to do that. And if that doesn't work, you want to rule out other alternate diagnoses at this level. Now, if your patient was not taking ICS containing treatment, he's, your, he's a fresh case, we would do spirometry or PEF and check for that and start with the initial treatment which is given empirically. Now, because he came to you with distress, you would not do PFT on the first visit. You'll wait for him to get better. You'll call him back at one or three months based on his symptoms. And then you have to ascertain the diagnosis to so do diagnostic testing. Now, if your patient who did the diagnostic testing and still, you know, the uh, diagnosis is not established, you do not see any airflow limitation, you should look at alternative diagnosis also. And however, there may be instances where he will have a normal right now, but later on when you repeat the test, it will be abnormal. So you should try to repeat this parametry if you really suspect that this is an asthmatic patient. So this is how we generally approach an asthmatic. Now, when you have these classical symptoms of wheeze, breathlessness, cough, and chest tightness, when do you think that there's more probability of this patient to be asthmatic? And when is the less probability on your history? So if we have more than one symptom, so like there is wheezing and breathlessness or cough and chest tightness, there's more likelihood. And if this patient just comes with cough, he has no chest tightness, he doesn't have any wheeze, he doesn't have any, you know, any breathlessness, then make sure that there is no alternative diagnosis here. Secondly, patients with asthmatic, usually typically we all know, will give a nighttime worsening history. And along with that, early morning, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 3 a.m., getting up in the middle of the night, that is more probable towards asthma diagnosis. But if this patient comes and says that my prime problem is a lot of sputum production, then probably he's not a primary asthmatic unless it's complicated with, uh, you know, bacterial infections recurrent. So again, look at alternate diagnosis. Thirdly, remember I said variability is a sense of asthma. So he will have variable symptoms. Every year, the symptom changes. Our every season, it may change. But if your patient says that there is no variability, he's having a persistent breathlessness 
And he also complains of other associated factors. Say, there's paresthesia, there's dizziness, there's atypical chest pain. Look out for other diagnoses. All asthmatics will usually report certain triggers, which can be varied. And um, asthma is not usually associated with strider or severe chest pain, which is radiating. So again, look out for other diagnoses. Except yes, when he has very severe bronchospasm, he may feel extreme chest tightness and pain at that time. The other thing that um, has been specifically mentioned in this chapter is about the criteria in children because uh, even as a diaphragmologist, we do see a lot of toddlers and children who come with us for persistent airway complaints. So here you have to remember that when you're diagnosing pediatric asthma, there should be again variable symptoms. Then you have to confirm a variability in expiratory airflow limitation and document it in a child. So there is nothing like a presumptive asthma. You must be able to document it in, especially in pediatric population. What are the criteria for airflow limitation? This is something that can get overlooked if you don't go deeper into the guideline statement. So remember, positive bronchodilator response has to be elicited after 10 to 15 minutes of inhaler. And which inhaler? That would be uh, salbutamol. In adults, we give 400 micrograms or so 4 puffs of 100 microgram inhaler. In children, you could give 200 microgram. And even in some adults, you might want to give 200. So there's, again, uh, the guidelines have started varying on that. So 200 to 400 would be acceptable limit. In adults, you want to see an increase in FEV1 of 12% and more than 200 ml in FEV1. And it's even better if you see a response more than 14% in 400 ml that then you're almost totally convinced that this is asthma. In children, whatever their baseline was, from that if it increases to 12%, that will be taken as a positive bronchodilator response. Remember that to do this test, we have to stop the inhalers of Saba for at least 4 hours. If he was taking twice daily lava, so twice daily formatrol or um, he was taking salmatrol, then stop the inhaler for at least 24 hours. So if he's coming to you first parametric in the evening, the last dose should have been last evening. And if you're giving him once daily ultra lavas, which are the latest, then it should be 36 hours of withhold of bronchodilator. So that's very important. PF is also taken, peak expiratory flow is also taken as an acceptable criteria to demonstrate variability in airflow limitation. Here in adults, the average daily diurnal variability should be more than 12%. What is diurnal variability? It means that with the same PF meter, the day's highest minus the day's lowest PF divided by the mean value of the day's highest and lowest in 200. That will give you the diurnal variability. So the day's highest minus lower minus lowest divide by the mean of the highest and lowest values, so the middle value, the mean value in 200, that is the diurnal variability. What is it for adults? More than 12%. What is it for children? More than 13%. After treatment, after we've given four weeks of inhaled corticosteroid regimen, we want to see at least an improvement of FEV1 more than 12% and 200 ml. That is a positive response in case you did not do the test initially. There are also exercise challenge tests. We do not do it routinely in day-to-day -day clinical practice, but we must know that when we give an exercise challenge, if there is a fall in FEV1 more than 10% and more than 200 ml from baseline, it's positive. And in children, more than 10% and 15% PEF from baseline, that fall is positive. Also, between, variability, between various visits, you could get a variability. This has a very good specificity. So if the patient comes this time and uh, you elicited a particular level of FV1 and between visits, the fall is more than 12%. So, so suppose he had uh, 2 liters and then next visit you see there's a fall of more than 12% between two visits and more than 200 ml, then you could say that yes, there is a variability in an airflow limitation. Obviously, rule out infections and exacerbations. And in children, a fall of FV1 more than 12% and more than 15% of PF between visits. 
So this documentation of variability is very, very important. When you talk about expiratory FU limitation, many times the situation rises where your FUV1 is reduced. Now here you have to also confirm that FUV1 on FPC should also reduce compared from the low limit of normal. So for an adult, the normal is different than a child. The normal for an adult will be 75 to 80 percent. So not 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent. And for a child, the normal value is 90 percent. So even 80 percent will be abnormal for a child less than 12 years of age. Physical examination, we all know that. It sometimes may also be normal. Remember that most frequently what we see is the expiratory V's, but sometimes we do not get the expiratory V's or normal breathing. And it's helpful to ask the patient to forcefully expire then. You may be able to elicit that beautiful sound of the V's, which to me, I'm very happy when I hear the V's because I know I'm in the right direction. Sometimes you may not get V's, so it's not absolute, especially when there's a severe exacerbation and that is a red flag. If in your known asthmatic, there is no V's, and it's a silent chest that is actually worse. We need to manage them right away. Wheezing, we know there are a lot of differentials for wheezing. A lot of times it comes in COPDs, in respiratory infections, the laryngeal dysfunction, uh, children tracheomalacia, foreign body. And um, remember that in asthma, repetitions are not a usual feature unless there is an infection. So again, it's important to make sure that you're diagnosing the right patient. I never ever forget my nasal examination in all my allergy and asthma patients and it's very rewarding. You would see allergic rhinitis, you would see in, uh, inferior turbinate hypertrophy and sometimes you also see polyps. Make sure you do that. That makes a lot of difference in our practice because we're able to treat that as well and they are common causes of respiratory disturbance in these patients. Coming to uh, the GINA recommendations, uh, for diagnosis in patients who already come on ICS regimen, they are already taking inhalers. Um, you need to still confirm the variability of respiratory symptoms. Once your diagnosis is confirmed, uh, you can give them treatment right away right now and then call them back and confirm the diagnosis, see the level of control and see if he needs any modification in regimen. Sometimes you will see the symptoms are varying but the airflow limitation is not varying. So you're not getting uh, an abnormal value, but you think clinically it is asthma. You call him back for spirometry. So you withhold the bronchodilators, make sure you withheld them for the right time. And you call him back. You check the variability between visits, because remember, variability between visits is also a criteria for variability. And um, if, if this patient has a good control and spirometric values are good, you can step down the ICS containing treatment now and you call him back in a month's time and then consider the right dose. If your patient is not performing well, his FP1 is less than 70% predicted, you need to step up. Step up should be maintained according to GINA guidelines for at least three months. And then after three months, you reassess the patient and the lung function. And you feel that now this patient is performing better, you continue the same dose. Otherwise, you need to see and investigate the patient for other causes. Now, sometimes patient does not have enough symptoms. His lung function is normal. You are not able to demonstrate a variable airflow limitation. Right? Then you need to recheck your diagnosis. You need to recheck the bronchodilator responsiveness. And if he's on very high ICS containing regimen, he doesn't have symptoms now, you should consider stepping down. Also, sometimes patient is the reverse of this condition where he has a lot of persistent breathlessness and airflow limitation despite your regimen. Then one, you need to consider stepping up the regimen for three months and see for the response. You reassess him, you control all the other factors like inhaler technique, uh, what kind of device he's taking, are there any other factors like GERD, obesity, smoking that are responsible for his worsening? Is it an asthma COPD overlap? And we rule out all of these uh, by doing further investigations. Regarding stepping down of ICS, always remember the ask, assess, adjust and review. The assess, adjust and review always 
helps you to decide when it's the right time to step down. So assess the patient. You document that this patient is currently stable, his level of control is good, his ACQ is well under control, his lung function is fine. Now, if this patient you think has a risk for asthma exacerbation, you make sure you tell him that I'm stepping you down and you may get an exacerbation, so be wary. You adjust, you show the patient that we are changing your ICS dose and you may have to increase it. You change the ICS dose not by much, but almost 25 to 50%. So if you were on 200, you can switch down to 100, that's 50%. And or if you was on lava and ICS combination, you may want to consider stopping the lava. And um, then you reschedule a visit sooner. So I would call him in two weeks and make sure he's stable. Review the response. Repeat the PFT after a month or so. If his symptoms are increasing, you need to re-step up. Or you bring him to that lowest dose on which his level of control was good. And if after stepping down, you feel now he's good, he's doing well with the lower dose, uh, then maybe you should try even stopping the ICS containing treatment if he was not in a high dose. Ask him to take it again as SOS. We'll be talking about that in the next one where we talk about the flow chart. But um, remember that he has to take ICS during his acute episode SOS as well. And you call him back for lung function reassessment at regular interval and follow this patient so that he doesn't lose track of the control. Now, um, another thing that's very specifically mentioned is the various differentials in diagnosis. This chart for children really helps us in adults as well because it keeps us aware of the various types of mimickers that we have. But we must know that usually in less than 12 years age group from children from toddlerhood to 12 years, there may be risk of the on body, there may be reason because of other factors, um, so like congenital heart disease, we have to rule out again congenital lung defects, like bronchopulmonary dysplasia, upper airway top syndrome. In children um, which are much younger, although we don't deal with them directly, laryngomalacia is also very strong differential. In adults, always rule out allergic rhinitis, always rule out uh, GERD related cough, always rule out dysfunctional breathing. Uh, again, uh, foreign body and other differential stay. In elderly patients, COPD, a strong mimicker, uh, again recurrent lung infections and bronchitis, heart failure related, so cardiac disease, medication related cough, we know Ramipril, uh, pulmonary embolism, other lung diseases and central level obstruction due to tumors. But at all age, infections and TB in Indian circumstance has to be ruled out. Coming to the investigation, there's a special mention of pheno, so I'll mention that. Now it's said uh, in the guidelines that pheno does have a modest association with sputum eosinophils and blood eosinophils, so you can use it as a surrogate marker. What I want to add in is that pheno never rules in or diagnoses asthma and never rules out asthma. Pheno is a marker of inflammation and typically correlates with eosinophilic inflammation. So pheno can be a very good guide to classify your patients as T2 high asthma, eosinophilic inflammation and T2 low. It has very good implications when you talk about treatable traits and phenotypic assessment of asthma. So pheno is a good biomarker, although it's not absolute. And do not take pheno levels as a marker to diagnose asthma. It is not elevated in neutrophilic asthma, the T2 low asthma. So that is the way it helps us in choosing biologics as well. It is lower in smokers and early responses and it may be variable in infection. So make sure you rule out these conditions. There's some mention of asthma in special context. Uh, you need to remember that sometimes we have a non-productive cough which is persistent and that's the only complaint, only cough. Here, rule out all the other differentials, uh, allergic rhinitis, sinusitis, GERD, cough variant asthma, again the nighttime asthma, but you will get a lung function variability here. Uh, then there are cases who may have occupational asthma, work-related asthma, and uh, in a lot of these patients, you have certain allergic signs already, and you can ask this patient to monitor his PEF when he's at work and out of work. There are special concentrations in athletes. Uh, in athletes, uh, it's a good example where bronchial provocation testing is sometimes done. 
uh, but we have to rule out mimickers like cardiac disease. Is the patient getting overtrained, and is that the reason why he comes breathless or has more cough? So all that has to be ruled out. The other is pregnancy. You all must have heard of the one third rule, the thirty three percent rule. The thirty three percent pregnant women may worsen. Thirty three percent may remain same, and thirty three percent may exacerbate. So on those lines, there may be an increase in asthma during pregnancy. So do not try to do the stepping down of asthma during pregnancy. Elderly, we know there are a lot of differentials. Cardiac disease being one, they have poor perception of their symptoms. So again, in these patients, acceptance of dyspnea comes as normal. We have to keep a close watch on them, and we have to rule out cardiovascular issues. Sometimes we can use proBNP. Many of them may be COPDs or have an overlap. So keep that in mind. Uh, present smokers and ex-smokers. Sometimes it's difficult to differentiate asthma and COPD in the presence of smoking. But in those cases, um, some things that can help us is bronchodilator response, and COPDs usually have a lower diffusion lung capacity than asthmatics. The next is obesity. Obesity uh, related symptoms can also mimic asthma. So again, keep a close watch. And there's special mention about a para about lower middle income countries in asthma, where there may be a difficulty in assess accessing spirometry. So here, in such cases, they are saying that it's it should be wise to try and do spirometric, at least parametric assessment of most of your suspects. So that's it with the first chapter on in the GINA guidelines. I will see you next soon with another chapter. Please uh, subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends. And let me know in the comment section if you want to see more videos on a particular topic and the treatable traits one as well. I would love to make a video on that. So thank you and bye-bye.